everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lindsay Brown from the Beyond Clean team. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this collaborative webinar series between Beyond Clean and Census Technologies. This month, the True Grit series is focused on leadership. A good leader is a person who applies the positive characteristics of grit to bring the best out of everyone they work with. This month, Census wants to give you an opportunity to recognize the healthcare leaders you know. So stay tuned to the end of this webinar for more information on how you can nominate your favorite leader. If you haven't joined Beyond Clean for a virtual event in the past, I'd like to call your attention to a couple of features. On your screen, you'll find a list of resources that the speaker for today's webinar has for you. These resources will allow you to take uh, a little bit further and do some more self-reflection and self-study um, at your own leisure. Question and answers tool on the left-hand side of your screen. As the presenter is presenting the topic, feel free to submit any questions that you have throughout the presentation. Whenever a question pops up, feel free to enter it into that uh, question and answer tool, and it will be addressed at the end during the question and answer portion of the presentation. I am so excited for today's presentation about the unique device identifier. Why was it developed? What is its purpose? And how does it integrate with the 21st Century CARES Act, previously known as Meaningful Use? Our presenter for today is the great Jean Sargent. Jean has nearly <laughs> 30 years in leadership positions that span central service and materials and supply chain management in hospitals and healthcare systems, GPOs, service companies, consulting firms, Jean is passionate. She's passionate about supporting yes. patient safety in the adoption and implementation of the UDI and has been actively involved mm -hmm. with education for many years as a speaker, an educator, a writer, editor. She's a recognized leader in the industry and it is my sincere to now turn it over <laughs> to Jean. Well, thank you so much for that, Lindsay. I appreciate it. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to this group about the unique device identifier and something that Lindsay mentioned is uh, very dear to my heart. I um, started talking about this back in 2008 and here we are 12 years later still talking about it and uh, still educating about it. So thank you for tuning in and uh, let's go ahead and get started. So as Lindsay mentioned with the objectives, we're gonna outline the unique device identifier, the regulation, summarize the involvement of the rest of the um, uh, federal agencies that are involved, uh, talk about how this affects and impacts patient safety, and then talk about your role as a sterile processing personnel uh, in the UDI. So we're gonna start off with a polling question and I'd like you to click on the slide and go ahead and answer the question. How many of you are scanning at the instrument level and then to the tray? So if you do that, I'll give you about 10, 15 seconds here. Okay, we'll go ahead and move forward and see what the responses are. Yes, no, it's in the future plan. Oh, that's great to see. That's great. So there are many of you that are uh, scanning to the instrument level today. And that's something that I've seen in the past and I see how smoothly it can work. I know a lot of people are concerned that uh, scanning down to the instrument is going to be very time consuming, but in fact, in the work stream that you work with, it really does not add that much time to it. I mean, split seconds is really what it, what it amounts to. So that's gonna be important as part of this UDI and moving forward and part of the patient safety. So let's talk about the regulation. There were interested parties, patient safety advocates that worked with lobbyists to create this regulation for the FDA. Now it took years and years for it to get uh, put into a regulation and it was signed into regulation in September of 2007. And again, here we are 13 years now 
still talking about it and educating, which it takes us a little bit more time in healthcare to really get to that next step. So what were some of the reasons? So back in the 90s, a book called To Air is Human came out, and it talks about the patients that are hurt while in healthcare facilities or having procedures done. And for those of us who are a little bit older, back about the same time, the Firestone Company had uh, tire issues. And there were seven people that were killed from car accidents from the tires. I hate to say it, but in healthcare, we actually hurt or kill hundreds of thousands of people every year. We just don't talk about it the way they talk about Firestone types of stories. We don't hear about it on the news like uh, we did. And also back in the 90s were the uh, breast implant recalls for saline breasts that were causing severe harm to many patients and even death. And I'm sure you're thinking, well, that was the 90s. Why are you talking about this now? Well, these were some of the drivers to get this regulation put into place and to be able to have information to provide a better patient experience and to know when something goes wrong, who had the issue and what was done about it. So as we go through the presentation, I'll talk more about the details. So again, the UDI is a regulation. The regulation is for manufacturers. Manufacturers are required to uh, have the unique device identifier on all of their products. So people say, well, that's for the manufacturers. Why are you talking this to us in healthcare? Well, the FDA doesn't have authority over healthcare. The FDA has authority over manufacturers. So they're able to tell the manufacturers you must have this information on your product packaging, but they can't say that to healthcare. So that's where the other government agencies come in to talk about, you know, how can we push this through on the backside with the healthcare facilities and that patient safety aspect. And then the global unique device identifier database is another piece of this that the FDA had to develop. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I went ahead and left this in, but this is the legalese. And if you're interested in looking for the exact, uh, the exact regulation, you can uh, look at what these numbers are here, and it should also be included in your uh, resources. So essentially, it's saying that the um, manufacturers have to abide by this ruling. So the first step is the manufacturers apply the labels and they also have to populate the good ID. The next step is to get the products with the UDID and use the access good ID to populate electronic health records as well as registries. The next is to monitor the UDI in adverse events and also to analyze the manufacturer model data so if we go back to the first step, the manufacturers apply the UDI. The manufacturer printing the unique device identifier on the label is not an easy task. They have certain amount of space, and we know we've got small items like a needle, or we have large items like a surgical pack. So it really varies. So it's not that easy for the manufacturer to just put this information on the label. It takes them uh, time and effort and uh, making sure they're following their quality processes, et cetera. So this has really been burdensome for the manufacturers, but in a good way, if we at the back end actually scan this information. So on the access good ID, what this is saying is that you're actually able to scan a product and it should take you to the good ID which is going to give you the various attributes. So it might be latex free, it might be MRI compatible, um, it could be the size that's in there. There's a lot of information that the access good ID. And I've seen clinicians actually 
pick up a product, scan it, look at the good ID, and say, wow, this is so great. I actually have the rest of the information I need on this product right here in the good ID. And we want that same information brought into the patient's record. So how are we going to do that? Monitoring the uh, adverse events is really important. How do we know what patient had a product that was recalled or if they had an adverse event, what's the information for that product that we can tie back to the UDI, tie back to the FDA in that adverse event reporting? Then the next step is that if a manufacturer, say a sterilizer manufacturer develops a new sterilizer, the process that they would go through to get that approved through the FDA is that they would say we're very similar in this other brand of sterilizer in that this is how our sterilizer performs and it's equal. It's not starting from fresh, like say something like the intuitive robot. They had to start from scratch because um, they were the first robot that was out, right? So what the FDA plans on doing with this information is saying, okay, well, this sterilizer said it was the same as that sterilizer. Let's look down the road and see how many issues we had with either one of those sterilizers and really should we have approved that sterilizer or should we be looking at the first sterilizer because maybe it's not up to date. So you take that down to the level of a um, drug eluding stent, right? And you say, okay, this caused patient harm. You report that back to the FDA and to the manufacturer. The manufacturer ha now has the UDI information that they can track in their system. When was that product manufactured? They can go back to their quality and safety protocols and, and figure out where the issue is. Or was it an issue with the patient's uh, body just rejecting it? So to have that information and for the FDA to be able to now compare like products to see, is there a difference in the outcome? And that's called comparative effectiveness. So these compliance dates are specifically for the manufacturers. So you can see the very first compliant date was back in 2014. And those are all class three devices. So those are mainly your implants that fall into that category. The next year, um, it was also another section of implantables, life supporting, life sustaining. The next year was the rest of the class two devices. And you can see the class uh, one devices got moved to September of 2020, which was just a, about a month ago. But what's happening is that the FDA is saying they really want these manufacturers to get this information on the label, but they're not going to start checking them for another two years. So the compliance dates for the other categories, they're, the FDA is checking those now. But the class one devices is going to be like your four by fours, your Q-tips, your band-aids, um, what I like to refer to as the doodads, right? How important is it that we have that barcode label on the package? And is the clinician, are we expecting the clinician to actually scan it? That's something that is still up for discussion. So this class one is going to be a little bit different, and we'll see how it actually works out uh, in a couple of years from now. So if you look at a lot of your products, I know Medline and their self-manufactured products, they've had the UDI on their products for probably a couple of years now. And many of the manufacturers already have that are producing the class one devices already have the information on their packages and it's in the good ID. So um, people are looking to be compliant. So what is the UDI? Um, if we look at it, it's really two pieces of the puzzle. One is the device identifier. So that's gonna be like the catalog number. That's the part that doesn't change. It's always gonna be part number one, two, three, four. What's going to change is the production information. So if there's a lot number, a serial number, or an expiration date, that is what is going to change. So the DI is static, the PI is what changes. 
And when we talk about this in our systems, you know, in the material system, supply chain system, even in the OR system, we're going to have that DI information there as it's always going to be there. But when the clinician scans that product, it's when the PI information will get pulled in. So promoting interoperability, um, the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act was passed back in 2009. And um, it's led by the Office of the National Coordinator in NCMS. And it's also related to the Healthcare Information Technology, the High Tech Act that you might have heard of. It was called Meaningful Use up until April of 2018. And we're, they're also looking for reporting on quality measures, like I had mentioned before. So having this interoperability is really important. The, um, I was, uh, as I mentioned, I've been very... The meetings that I attended was actually in Washington, D.C. with the Office of the National Coordinator, which is... Uh, appointed by the president. So, uh, boy, talk about nervous. <laughs> but uh, talking to them about why this is so important and why we really needed the back end, the uh, CMS, the uh, electronic health records to have the capabilities to require this UDI information for patient safety. So I've been touting my little UDI flag everywhere I go. Um, but the, uh, so the ARRA is something that's backing this up. Um, another meeting that I went to was for a standards committee. So we used to refer to this as standards. Uh, now it's UDI. But when we talked about standards and we were talking to the uh, group that runs the electronic health care records certification, he says, we have standards. We said, well, they're not the same as our standards. And he wasn't aware of the UDI and all that. And so when we talked to him, he says, oh, my gosh, that's really important. So it actually got put into that certification process in uh, what was phase three of meaningful use. So the label requirements, it has to be in a human and machine readable format. So if for some reason that barcode doesn't scan, you're able to enter in the numbers, which we all know what happens when we're typing in numbers, right? That we're working really fast and we might miss a number, so we more than likely will have misinformation on a percentage of the uh, hand entering that we do. So the other piece to that is the manufacturers have to check their barcodes before they leave. They have to do quality checks to make sure that the barcodes are legible and readable with the barcode scanners. So uh, in order to prevent that uh, issue from occurring. So you can see here we have the DI and the PI. And this is called a linear barcode. And this here is called a 2D uh, matrix barcode. I'll take this minute to point out that a linear barcode reader cannot read a 2D barcode reader. And a lot of the manufacturers are going to 2D because it's a much smaller piece of uh, landscape on that labeling. So you have to make sure that you've got a barcode scanner that can read both 2D and the um, linear barcode. So one of the issues we had with uh, when we were talking with the FDA about uh, some of some things that they needed to take into consideration was that we needed to have standardized barcodes. So in the end, the FDA only approved GS1, HIBIC, and ICC BBA, which is the blood bank or the tissue banking, and that's it. Because our concern was if every single manufacturer comes up with their own um, GD, UDI type of label, they're going to look different. And how's that clinician going to know what to scan? So what the FDA, going back to the words are now pictures here. So we've got the regulation. It's to the manufacturers and then to the um, healthcare providers. 
we want to capture that documentation for the patient, for the billing, for the FDA, and for registries. What a registry is, is that, uh, and I didn't realize till, until I was speaking with a um, cath lab director the other day, that there are multiple registries. Used to be that it was, uh, there's an orthopedic registry and a cardiac registry, and then there was a urology registry, and now the registries have been subdivided. So in the cardiology space, I think she said they're submitting information to eight different registries. So what happens with that registry information is that's that one stop that the um, physician will go to to look for that patient's information. So if that patient is coming from a different hospital where they had that stent put in, the physician can look in the registry to understand what type of stent was put in and when and look at the operative notes and some of that information to be able to uh, determine what the next step should be. So it's all really important and again, focusing on patient safety. This is something that I used in my slides since 2008. And you think, wow, it's really old, but not much has changed, which is sad to say. So for those of you who don't get that involved with the item master, you know, 3M calls this product an 8630. That's their catalog number. What the distributors do is the distributors will incorporate that number but they have leading numbers that are specific to their distribution site. So back when I was Nolan's a minor customer, I knew that 45 meant that that was that distribution center. They were numbered. So we add, then the distributors add in this information. And then it comes to the hospital. The hospital assigns it an item master number. So we just keep diluting and diluting and diluting what this information is and the ability to trace it back when we need to. So at some point in time in the future, what we want is to have people just refer to the UDI number instead of the catalog number, instead of the distributor number and um, our item master number. But I'm sure, uh, I hope I'll be retired by then. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the other government agencies that are involved. Uh, so Pew Charitable Trust is a nonprofit organization that uh, works with many different segments, not just healthcare. But one of the things that they see as valuable is exchanging that health data between providers. And why? So that the providers are able to take care of that patient in a safe manner, having that information. They created a work group called the Work Group for Electronic Data Interchange. And what they did in that work group is they looked at, okay, how can we make this interoperable? So going from one system to another system and back again. And there are several systems that this information needs to flow through. So they submitted a business case. But really what their focus was, was for the... Uh, CMS to add the UDI to their uh, billing statement. And uh, CMS was opposed for quite a while. They said it's a huge magnitude. They're not going to be able to take it on maybe 2025, 2028. So Pew is working very closely with the X12 group who um, it's all that uh, <laughs> detailed computer stuff that I don't really know. But um, so they're working with that group to develop a system to be able to capture that information on the uh, billing. And the plan to go live is in 2022. What's going to happen is that we have so many healthcare providers that say, well, this is for the manufacturers. It's not about us. Well, the way that we're getting it to be about the provider is that there will come a point in time when Medicare will be requiring that UDI information on the bill. And if they don't get it, the hospital doesn't get reimbursed. So they're going to have to provide it and it might delay getting reimbursed. And for people who may not understand, most hospitals have between 40 to you know 70% of their patients are Medicare patients. 
So when they're not getting reimbursed, and we're seeing it today with the COVID, right? We don't have all those regular patients in the hospital. So we can see that it has a huge impact on the bottom line. So whether organizations decide to look at this and be prepared or at the last minute are going to be scrambling, um, that's going to be a big part of this. So I talked about this. Um, somehow my slides got mixed up. So we have the Office of the National Coordinator, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, so ONC, CMS, CDC, who everybody's heard of, especially now if you hadn't in the past, and the Light National Library of Medicine. So the National Coordinator, the ONC, this was who we went and talked to about pulling in standards the UDI into the electronic health records. So they determine that certification criteria. So the electronic health records, in order to be certified, must meet certain criteria. What this is all about is having that standardized medical record that whether you as a patient go see your doctor or you go into a hospital for a procedure, that information is able to translate from one system to the other and back again. So they support funding to healthcare providers who upgrade to these certified EHRs. So going back to that meaningful use, phase one, phase two, phase three, the hospitals were given uh, dollars back on what they spent to, in, to uh, upgrade, to be able to utilize that certified electronic health record. So again, part of this is that having that meaningful use phase three, the interoperability now, whoever has done that has been reimbursed for at least part of their expenses for capturing that information. So I'm certain that by now a lot of you are there and that information is out there in the background, but maybe not necessarily in use, or maybe you just don't realize that it's in use. So there were multiple implementation phases because of the magnitude of these uh, electronic health records having to change what their record uh, looked like. And this reports up to the Office of Management and Budget. So that's why we went to the standards group first and then went and spoke to the Office of Management and Budget. So the um, UDI regulation included that CMS would be part of this program. Um, Health and Human Services, which is a division of the CMS, supports the UDI in claims. So back in 2016, they came out and said that they uh, supported the UDI for implants. So the evaluation of product performance, as I mentioned earlier, which would be called comparative analysis, any type of analysis that would show if one product works better than another, any type of device innovation. So when that new pacemaker comes out, okay, so it's new, it's different. What's, what are the patient outcomes? Are they truly what the manufacturer in their uh, testing had come up with? Is that really what's happening? And what are the costs of those innovations? And again, what are the outcomes of those innovations? So that patient gets that new and improved defibrillator, is it really making a difference over that patient that received the previous defibrillator? Having that information is going to be very important. It's important now, and um, I, I'm really hoping that we can get across that finish line to have this uh, UDI implemented and be able to sit back and say, look what we did. So I talked about the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, so on the CC, their involvement is you know, public health. So they're looking at these products as well from that public health aspect. Is that new defibrillator really better for the patient? And was the last defibrillator actually causing harm? And if it was, to who and how many and what was done to rectify? They're, they also uh, track cancer. So those cancer treatments. So the UDI is not just supplies, it's supplies, equipment. Pharmaceuticals have their own type of UDI called the NDC. So having all of this 
information to be able to put together what transpired with this patient that they had a negative outcome, whatever that negative outcome might have been that they were harmed or even worse. The National Library of Medicine actually is hosting the Global Unique Device Identifier, the Good ID uh, database. And um, the manufacturers are required to submit certain uh, data into the Good ID, as I mentioned earlier. The GMDN, which I'll talk about in a minute, the different sizes. That we had physicians that are saying, you know, it matters that I know what the inside diameter is, what the outside diameter is, and what the length is of that catheter that I'm using or that stent that I'm using or the guide wire, whatever it is, right? So in our item master, we're really limited in the number of spaces that we have to create that UDI or create that description. So what we see happening is it might say stent, it might say uh, drug eluding, and then it might say, you know, whatever French, but then the rest of it is left off, the inside, outside diam diameter, and then the length. And the physician really needs to know that information. So by scanning the barcode on that, although it says it uh, on the package, but by scanning that barcode, going to the good ID, the information will be there. And again, the types of attributes like latex-free or MRI-compatible, sterile, not sterile, um, various attributes. And anybody has the ability to go into the good ID to pull down data. So any one of you can go to the National Library of Medicine and request a login to access good ID information. And that's really important for the IT people because we want them to pull this information and pull it into our item masters, which are then connected to the electronic health record and then to billing. So the GMDN, I know I struggle every day in the work that I do with supply chain to have what's that standard information. So going back to the catalog number I showed you earlier, also the standardized uh, device, how are they described? So the manufacturers have to follow this GMDN, Global Medical Device Nomenclature, that's who the FDA contracted with to use their schema to create those descriptions. Most of those descriptions is what we should be using in our own systems. However, nothing's perfect, right? Nothing is ever one-to-one. -one. And so we have all kinds of different descriptions, whatever each different facility says, or there are um, software providers out there that will provide you with a good description, which may not be the description you're looking for. Um, so. This is another piece of the puzzle where the FDA is trying to get down to that standardized information by using this GMDN and encouraging the healthcare facilities to use this GMDN as well. And one of the pieces of this is having that uh, information in that access good ID to be able to pull the data and link it to those systems or to have that data and create data points um, to look at how your products are working with your patients and patient safety and the positive outcomes. So uh, back in 2015, the, uh, the ONC came out with this expanded common clinical data set. So that again is to promote that interoperability. So the electronic health records must have the capability to capture these 23 data points and the providers are required to capture this information on the electronic healthcare record. So what are some of those data points? Well, look at that unique device identifier for a patient's implantable. And this has been since 2015, although the in order for the hospitals to be compliant and get their um, piece of the pie reimbursement, it was uh, January of 2018 that the hospitals had to be in compliance, that they were able to provide um, all of this information. So that's why I say might be happening in the background that you're not aware of, or hopefully you are, 
And uh, if you're not, you can uh, talk to your organization to find out more about it. So this is an example of the good ID. So this barcode was scanned. Here's the good ID. Here's where the information is and the rest of the data points that are here in the good ID. And it's the same thing here with this vascular quality initiative was uh, supported by a group of physicians working to get that clinically relevant size and the other information that's important to them to have in that patient's electronic health record. Sure, what happened here with some of my slides, but okay. So, uh, discover how the missing UDI information impacts patient safety. So, what are some of the challenges? So, medical error is third leading cause of death, but now it's the fourth behind COVID. So, when you think about it, you hear about cancer, you hear about heart attacks, you hear about stroke, you hear about all of these other illnesses but we don't talk about medical errors and how it impacts patients. They're life-changing. Could be that patient, uh, patient passes, or it could be that that patient now has you know, disabilities that they're not able to go back to work. They're preventable. You know, what we do is we react. We're not proactive, we're reactive. And we've had little improvement of more than 10 years of focus which really goes back to the book, To Air is Human, which was 20 years ago. So when it, I say it takes out their time to, uh, to make these changes, it really does. So look at this. These are medical device recalls. And this is for one year. So we had uh, infusion pumps, 218,000 recalls, implantable cardio defibrillators, 164,000. How are we going to be able to know what patients had those products used on them? If it's implantable, it's a little bit easier, but may not be completely 100% traceable. So if you look at these, it's just, to me, I found it very shocking to see the number of uh, devices that were affected with these recalls. So now look at this, the MDR is attributable to deaths. So the drug eluding stent, there were 76,000 devices and 8,000 deaths. That's a pretty high percentage. And especially the way we utilize the drug eluding stents in so many patients, this is just one that was recalled. So 8,000 deaths, the defibrillator, 7,000 deaths, pacemaker electrode, 7,000, the dialysis, 2,000, infusion pumps, 1,100. It's just, the numbers to me are staggering. I, I just, when you think about, these are all people and families. And what does that add up to? And that's not everything. That's just the top few that I'm showing you. A lot of people are hurt every year with these medical device recalls. So these are the injuries. So you can see here, we've got the recalls, we've got the deaths, and we have injuries. Look at the number of injuries, 95, 92, 71. You know, this adds up to a lot of people, 300, 400, almost 500,000 people that were injured because of device failures and how many died. So having the UDI is going to be you know, extremely important to help us to track these deaths and these injuries. These are only the ones that we know about. It's not everything else that we don't know about. So it is just so important because you think about this, or I think about it, and I think that death could have been me. It could have been one of my family members, or that injury could have been me, or it could have been one of my family members. We're in the hospital every day. We see the patient's families that are just in agony because of what their family member is going through. The last thing that we wanna do is add to it. So let's do everything we can to be able to recall those devices before they get used on the patient. Know ahead of time, be more proactive than reactive in these um, 
patient recalls and preventing those deaths. So the purpose of the UDI is to improve quality, safety, and efficiency, engage the patients and their families in their health, improve care coordination, improve population and public health, and ensure adequate privacy, right? That's something that's really important. We don't want these electronic health records out in the cyber net where uh, they can be hacked. So that piece is really important. If I think about myself and I travel for work, or I had been traveling for work. So if I had something done when I was living in California and then I'm traveling to Boston and I now need to go see somebody for which I had a broken ankle in California, I got to the Boston area, I had to have that plate and screws removed. I had no idea what plate and screws were used on me. So luckily the um, my injury was that one of my screws came loose and it wasn't just up here, it was at my ankle. <laughs> and um, so uh, that was why they had to take them out. So was it a recall? No, because that's something that does happen in a certain percent. But not having any idea what type of plate and screws I had wasn't important, but I thought, you know, I think to myself, I sure wish I would have known um, just to have the information. All right, so I'm gonna talk about this real life case and then we're gonna have it as a polling question. So just as I was mentioning, if a patient had a hip replacement in California and now they're in New York and having complication, how does a surgeon know what brand and type of implant the patient has? The patient was given a card with information. The surgeon looks up the information in the electronic health record the clinicians have to call California to get the information or they go ahead and proceed with the surgery without noting that product information. So we're going to make this into a polling question and I'll talk about each one of these uh, responses afterwards. So check all that you think apply. So if you'll click on your screen and click on each that you think apply, we'll uh, check to see what your answers are and I'll talk through each one. Okay, all right, let's see what the answers are. <laughs> the patient was given a card with the information. That's true. And how many of those patients have that card with them, right? It, it, especially if you have somebody who had a hip replacement 10 years ago, or they had a pacemaker inserted 10 years ago, what are the chances of them having that, that card with them? The other piece is that the surgeon looks up the information in the electronic health record. Well, if we had UDI and we had all that interoperability, that would be possible. The clinicians have to call California to get the information. That happens most often, more than anything else, because what they'll do is they'll call to that hospital, they have to pull the medical record, they get the medical record out, they go through all the documentation to find out what implantable was there. And this can take hours. And then you've got a time change. So maybe it's seven in the morning East Coast and it's only four in the morning West Coast. And maybe there's nobody in medical records at that time or nobody that can stop to pull that information. So this delays that patient care. And depending on how bad the situation is, the uh, physician may just have to go ahead and proceed with surgery without knowing what the product information is. And where this involves you is that you have a patient that comes in and they need a revision. The physician doesn't know what product it is. So what do they do? They get at least three different manufacturers to bring in product and you're having to process all of those trays just in case because the physician doesn't know. So I think that should hit home to a lot of you. If you think about having to process 15, 20, maybe even 30 different trays, that is a huge time constraint for you. Whereas if the physician knew, you might get five trays. Big, big difference. So that's one of the main reasons how this um, affects sterile processing. So let's talk about other ways that it affects sterile processing. 
So as I mentioned, we've got all these different capabilities, right? So we've got supply chain. So that's where the item master is. So we've got the materials management information system. So that's going to be where the item master is. We have that EDI, electronic data interchange. So that EDI goes to the vendors to place those orders, or EDI is also used for billing. Uh, we have the good ID that we want to be able to transact information, pull information into the supply chain from the good ID. Also the distributor information and or the manufacturer information. So there's a lot of information that we want to pull into and have the capability to send out of supply chain. So what we want to do is have that interface that goes from the supply chain system, takes that item master information, that UDI information, sends it over to the OR. Why that is extremely important is when the OR goes to scan that product, it's in their system, they're able to scan the device identification, and then the product identification. So they scan that product information in, and now it goes into that patient's electronic health record. So we want to have that interoperability. It's the same thing with cath lab. Cath lab goes to scan that product. We need to have that interface and that interoperability or any type of point of use type of systems that are um, out there that have their own system. You want to have those interfaces. And then from there, it goes out to the patient charge goes to the electronic health record, or it goes to billing. So there's a lot of interoperability here that needs to be put in place in order to make all of this work and function and function easily for the clinician. Now, I think about it as the clinician. How can I make it easiest for the clinician to comply and capture this information as part of that patient safety? So asked you in the beginning about instrument tracking. Now, how many of you are doing instrument tracking or you're uh, tracking down to the instrument level or you're planning? And the numbers were great. I, I love to see that. I actually implemented instrument tracking um, almost 20 years ago at UCLA. And uh, it was driven by the head of anesthesia who was also the medical director for the OR. And she says, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. Now, we didn't have to the instrument scanning at that point, but we were tracking it through to the OR, to the patient, and, and back around again. You know, implant tracking, if you're responsible for any of the supplies that go into the OR, you're going to be responsible for those implants and that implant tracking. And that implant tracking is important because you want to make sure that the conditions that are required for that implant to be ready to be used might be time, temperature, and expiration date, whatever it is. So we've got that implant tracking that you might be involved with. The supply tracking, you, know, you get breast implants in for a specific patient. Those are implantables. How are you tracking those implantables? How do you know what was actually used and what was sent back to the manufacturing? ordering those products. We want to make sure that we've captured that information. So we're ordering the right product to replace what was actually used. We're tracking the returns. What are we returning? So that when we get that recall, we say, oh, we had some of those products, but we returned them. So we don't have to respond to this recall or that's your response to the recall. There, again, the recalls, having that information to know. I. Um, I've had uh, situations where I got a recall that was multiple pages long, and it took a staff member eight hours to go through all those pages to determine what we had, and then go to the system to figure out where they stocked, to hand off to a tech for them to go to those areas and search, and we can get 100% back, but we have no idea who they were used on. And it just scares me when I hear that, and I know that, and I don't want to be that patient that doesn't know and has a negative impact because of that. So here's that uh, laser scanner that I mentioned. This is a linear barcode with a linear scanner. But in order to capture this barcode, the 2D, you have to have a camera-based scanner. So that's my ankle with my uh, screws and plates. But we've got a lot of medical devices that we're tracking. We want to focus on the implantables. But we also want to know what instruments were used on the patient because that instrument could be that 
negative outcome for that patient, they actually want to think about scopes. And then the equipment used on patients. Years ago, we had a major IV pump recall, and we had patients that were harmed, but we could never completely tie everything back to this. So it's all about patient safety and your role. This slide here, it was actually from a German hospital. They've been doing instrument tracking down to this level for almost 10 years now. So in Europe, this is common practice to scan that instrument to the instrument level, to the tray and to that patient and having that information. You know, we talked about the supplies. Who's responsible for ordering the supplies and for making sure that what you need is on the shelf? Um, do you have case carts or is it open stock? Is it the special orders for that patient, those breast implants? What about consignment? How do we replace consignment? How are we tracking that serial number to know that this exact serial number was used on that patient? What about the own supplies? Do we have that interface and capability to take that serial number back to the material system so when the order goes back to the manufacturer, somebody isn't having to make a phone call and say, oh, by the way, that order you just got from us, here's what the serial number is because we don't have a way to transmit it electronically. And also tracking the expirations electronically is going to be so helpful for all of us. So there was a hospital that uh, we did an uh, orthopedic implant project, and I'm getting late on time here, so I'm not going to go through each one of the steps, but you can see what they looked at and how are the implants going to be tracked. Um, and so it was a huge project that was uh, completed about three years ago now. Um, and the outcome of that was this. You know, how are the manufacturers going to provide information for you to be able to have, um, to capture the UDI. And it's not one size fits all. It's all gonna be different. We have laser markings. We have the count sheets. So, okay, well, with this count sheet, we can say that it's this instrument that goes in this tray, but now there's talk about down to the serial number. And I go back to, do we need the serial number? I think on some instrumentation, yes but on your Mayo scissors, your, your standard instruments. I don't know that we need to get to that point with serial numbers, but at least know what manufacturer, uh, what manufacturer's uh, Mayo scissor was that was in that tray. Um, so we'll see how this all comes about, but there are people that are out there using these types of scanners today, as well as these barcodes and these sheets. So we're working on getting there um, it's, we're just not there yet. So one of the pieces that I thought was so important is the um, expiration date. On the expiration date, um, on the expiration date, uh, you can see it has to be in this format. So you ask one facility, so do you pull the expired product on the first day of the month or the last day of the month? And you get a different response. Now, it's very clear what date that product actually expires, and it's just making it so much easier for us. Now, if we can capture that information in the um, OR system or the cath lab system, we can run reports and say these products are going to expire. We can go check to see that they're still on the shelf, which if we're scanning, it should be one for one. Um, but it's really going to help us out when we're looking for those expired products. So how would you go about doing this? I'll go run through this real quick, but you, know, you wanna have the clinician supply chain, IT, sterile processing quality. You've got to have that executive support from up above that you're going to be scanning this information and letting the physician know how important this is gonna to be to them. Develop a plan, look at those systems, where do you need to have interfaces, engage the suppliers, um, conduct testing, and and create those standard policies and procedures and best practices. So I've given you a list of references, including here, I've got arm.org, and this is called the Learning UDI Community. Anybody can join, anybody can go in and look at this information. And there have been upwards of 20 uh, work groups that have worked on different projects on like the clinically relevant size. There was a whole project about that. And 
who needs what information and how we can go about making that work. I've also provided my information here for my email as well as my um, website. So if you want to reach out to me, you have more questions, that would be great. So with that, Lindy, I'll open it up to questions. Wonderful. Jean, thank you so much for providing such incredible information. Um, we did have quite a few really good questions come through. So I just want to make a quick note before we get into the question and answers. Um, make sure that you all take advantage of the additional resources allow, uh, provided for you on your screen. In about an hour, you'll receive an email that will have a link to this session on demand, uh, along with the link to access the session survey that you can download your CE certificate on. Uh, you can also click on the little CE icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, this session will likely run a little bit over an hour. Um, that's okay. Uh, we're excited to get to some of these really important questions, but I just wanted to give everyone a, a bit of a heads up. So for the first question that came through, um, it says, what was the result for how many scans at the instrument level? I don't know oh, that I, um, it was I don't have any high. additional details, but do you, <laughs> do you have an answer to that one? So um, the, uh, in, it was one of, in the polling question, it was, uh, it was pretty significant, the number of people that were looking at the, uh, or scanning at the instrument level, or had plans to scan at the instrument level. Um, are you pulling that up, Lindsay? Or... Yep, I just pulled it up for you. Okay, perfect, there we go, thank you. So you can see about almost 24% are scanning at the instrument level. 46% uh, or not, but 30% plan to in the future. So that gets us up over the half point. Um, but it is going to be important for you to have that information. You're scanning and, and uh, tracking the GI scopes today, but we need to expand that down to the instruments as well. Okay, great. Uh, another question that came through, how does this impact sterile processing and instrument management? Yeah, so on the instrument management side, if you look at your instruments, the newer instruments especially, because Europe has been scanning at the instrument level for so long, the manufacturers already have the barcode on the instrument. So a lot of your instruments have that barcode ready to go. So it's a matter of whether you use a supplemental um, dot or whatever it might be to label that instrument or you scan that instrument itself, it's, it's there now. Okay, great. Uh, this next question says, so 2D matrices are already on many new surgical instruments. Instruments yep. are often too small to have both a linear and matrix. How does the human and machine readable requirement apply here? So this is under the um, direct part marking. So we're talking about instruments, or if you have a patient with a pick line or a midline that is going to be left in for four to six months, it has to be on there as well for that future use. You're only going to get one or the other barcode. As you said, the linear barcode is going to be too big. So it's going to be that 2D data matrix. Where it becomes a bit of an issue is how do you get the rest of the information? So now you're going to have the 2D matrix on that instrument, but somewhere else on that instrument, it needs to be stamped with uh, the rest of the information. So it's going to be that catalog number or uh, UDI number that's going to be stamped on the instrument. Okay. Uh, this next question says, not all facilities have the money to purchase a tracking system. Some small facilities are having issues uh, with finding the funds to do so. What are those facilities? So my, um, what I've always said is that, you know, sterile processing, we're, we're not one of most concern, which is unfortunate, but maybe now we've got um, people looking at us as, something that's really important. So what I do is I say, you're not gonna go ask for an instrument tracking system alone. You're gonna go to the IT, your OR director, um, because the OR has to have the capability to scan, right? So they've gotta have some kind of a system, whether it's the electronic health record or it's a 
another type of system that feeds into the electronic health record. So you're not going to act, ask for that system alone. You're going to say, as part of this UDI, we need to have capabilities to track these instruments, so we need a system too. So not standalone, but inclusive of that overall program. Okay. Uh, what if we are not using UDI for individual instrumentation? You may not be using it today, but one of the expectations from the FDA, and we had a lot of conversation about this, is that they are going to expect that uh, you will be capturing that information. Again, they're not looking to, um, to check on the manufacturers for two more years, which usually it's another year or two after that before they come back, they get everybody together and come back to the hospitals and look for this. But there's no reason for you to wait. If, this, if, if you need a scanning system, you're getting ready so you're prepared when that time comes. And it's about patient safety today. A patient safety doesn't change and all of a sudden becomes important in 2024. It's been important for a really long time and we're way behind in, in being able to accommodate our patients the way we should, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there a deadline currently for instrument manufacturers to have UDI in place? So that would be the 2022 deadline, yes. Okay. Do you think that the future of UDI implementation will allow manufacturers to actually attach their most current IFU directly to the UDI? It would be in the, um, it would be in the access good ID would be where that IFU would be found. So you would be able to scan that barcode to the access good ID and be able to uh, be able to see that information. And I know it's got a lot easier than on the manufacturer's website. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many organizations have implemented tracking of UDI? I don't know what the exact number is. Um, we've got a lot of big institutions that have have implemented since you know five years ago when this or well 2014 six years ago when all this started so we have all of the mayo clinic we have all of the kaisers we have uh fmol at hs down in the louisiana area we have geisinger in the pennsylvania area and then mercy roi which is really in the central part of the states They've been drivers of this. They've got their physicians that are drivers. And so there are a lot of people that have implemented, but we don't really have a way to track. I think one of the things that we had talked about is as people ask for access to the good ID is where we're gonna be able to find where the people are, what institutions they're from. And as those numbers expand, we'll see how much it's really expanding its use. Okay, wonderful. We do have time for one more question. I know there are still a okay. lot of questions that have come through, but I will definitely get those over to Jean so she can uh, address those to you directly. But last question, how does right. or will UDI impact Medicare reimbursement for hospitals? Oh, absolutely, it will. You know, the way reimbursement works is Medicare sets the stage. So when Medicare says that, um, okay, we need to have this UDI information on the bill, and then the part where it says, or you're not gonna get reimbursed, the um, healthcare, the big insurance, Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Health Plans, all of them are gonna be wait, are waiting for the um, Medicare to populate that updated billing form because they want that information too. So it's not just Medicare that you're gonna have a hard time getting reimbursed if you don't provide the information. It's all of the insurance providers. They want to know that, that the hospital is using quality products and that they're providing a safe patient experience, that the risk management is on top of things, that we don't have recalls that we can't respond to. The insurance companies want to know all that because they're going to be looking at what should they be reimbursing if that hospital doesn't have all of these quality indicators. It can't demonstrate this. Okay. Jean, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, for sharing your passion for patient safety. It's evident, <laughs> palpable. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I know everyone 
tuned in and the audience certainly does as well. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, if you haven't yet downloaded the Census True Grit app, you will find a recording of this presentation along with all of the other True Grit webinars in this series. Um, exclusively on the Census True Grit, Grit app just posted yesterday uh, is an article written by Kelly Swales on leadership is key to employee engagement. That article is worth one CE. So if you're interested in reading it, finding out more and getting a, a free credit, uh, certainly uh, look for that exclusively on the Census True Grit app. This month, like I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this month, Census wants to give you an opportunity to recognize your healthcare leaders. All you have to do is sign up for the app, create a post telling us about your leader and how they embody the characteristics of grit, include a photo, and use the hashtag True Grit Leader Nominee. On behalf of Beyond Clean and in partnership with Census Technologies, we want to thank you. And thank you, Jean, um, for sharing your, you. this information with us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And as always, we encourage you to keep fighting dirty. We'll see you next time.